Hello everyone, my name is Philip Adu. Um, can you hear me? If you can hear me, you can type yes so that I will be sure. I'm rec recording this presentation um, for those who are not able to attend. So this presentation will be very, very different from my previous presentations because this one is, um, it will be based on the questions that you asked me, right? Um, so, um, because at the end of the day, I just want to make sure that I've addressed all your questions concerning data analysis, concerning using in vivo, concerning anything that you are struggling with in terms of qualitative data analysis. So, um, you can ask your uh, question by typing it in, in the chat box, or you can also talk. Um, I can give you the chance to speak um, if you are ready. Um, so, um, and my colleague, Dr. Glazek, will be helping me with the questions, um, helping me maybe in terms of reading the questions so that I'll be able to address them for you. So, um, as I'm speaking to you, you can, you know, stop me anytime and ask questions because I'm not doing a formal presentation. I'm responding to all the questions that you have concerning qualitative analysis. So, um, let's start before maybe I can ask, uh, you can start asking your question. Let me give you some background information, um, just a gen general overview concerning qualitative analysis. So, as you can see here, in temp whenever you think about qualitative analysis, this is what is going on. You as a researcher, you are like an instrument because you are collecting the data, you are analyzing the data. And this means that your personal or um, your beliefs and your background might influence the way you understand the data. So it's always important for you to be aware of your background, aware of who you are, aware of your beliefs, aware of your perception about the topic that you are focusing on, and be able to bracket those uh, biases. Um, so try and set the biases, beliefs, and background aside so that you'll be able to um, objectively interpret the data or objectively make meaning of the data that you have. So qualitative analysis is all about assigning label to significant statement. So you go through your data, based on your research question, you identify significant statement and you tell yourself, okay, what kind of label should I give to that statement, right? And then it's all about also data reduction because what you are doing is that you are summarizing the data, right, and presenting the summary as findings to address your research question. And in order to increase the credibility of the summary, in order to justify or help your audience to better believe what you have found, you have to show your audience how you arrived at the summary, right? So that's how you tell them, okay, I didn't identify significant information, I label them, and I categorize them, and then this is the findings, and this is how it's addressing my research question. And then you as a researcher, you are making meaning. You are trying to understand what participants are experienced or what participants have talked to you about, right? You just want to understand. And how do you understand? You have to assign labels. Uh, we have many methods of assigning labels. We call it coding, methods of coding. We have in vivo coding, we have value coding, we have emotion coding, we have teaming the data. Um, if you want more information about all these type of coding, um, when you go to slide share and you go to, um, I have a presentation on that that talks about the different kinds of coding process. You can get access to it. Let me copy and paste it on the chat box here um, so that you'll be able to assess that. There is a slide there um, that talks about different kinds of coding 
methods. So we have attribute coding, we have emotion coding. So the reason why you have to choose maybe two or three types of coding and when you are um, assigning labels to your significant information is to maintain consistency. So um, it will help you to be able to categorize the uh, code because they have something in common. So let's say you want to use emotion coding, you want to capture participant feelings and emotions. So um, when they describe their experience and then you can have the underlying meaning is for them to express the hopelessness, then you identify the information and then you label it maybe hopelessness. Are they expressing anxiety? Are they expressing pes uh, pessimism or denial? That is where you can use emotion code. You can use in vivo coding. In vivo means that you are using their own words to code. So if they say never again, I'm not going to do this, then you can use never again as a code, right? We have value coding, we have um, narrative coding. I will recommend this book for you. Um, this book talks about about maybe 35 coding methods. So you can, when you have access to the book, you'll be able to um, read and get more information about the coding methods that they have and how you're going to apply them in your data analysis process. So um, I have a nice diagram here that I just want to show you. Um, and that will help a little bit for you to understand what. So I talk about data reduction. So this is the data. You have reduced the data. You have summarized it. But you have to make sure that it's meaningful. It's a meaningful representation of the data that you have. And also it's addressing the research question. So your findings have to represent the data and address the research question that you have. So you are the researcher here. So as you can see here, you, you are expected to bracket your background, your biases, and then before you analyze your data. And then when you are analyzing the data, you are making meaning of participant experience. And then you assign labels to them called quotes. And what you, after assigning labels, you sort the label. You find out the similarities and the, um, um, the consistency. And based on that, you'll be able to ca categorize the code into categories and themes, right? And then you uh, use those themes to address your research question that you have. So you are moving from concrete information, right? You are moving from participant experience that they have talked to you, they have given you, and then you are developing abstract concept, right? that will help you to better understand the experience at the same time representing participant experience. You see that? So you look at their concrete information, you come up with abstract um, concept that will help your audience to better understand the experience of participants. So that's all about um, coding process or quantitative, um, qualitative analysis. Do you have any question? Um, as I said, this is not a presentation. This is a question and answer. So let me give you the chance to ask me a question. So I think that will help a lot. So any question that you want to get um, get answer to or you want me to answer, that would be great. Good morning, Dr. Adu. This is yes. Dante. How, Dante? Uh, yes, Mike. Hey, I had a question because um, I had run into this and I was curious if you have any examples of uh, coding. Uh, so I, I needed to apply uh, uh, a theoretical framework to uh, 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 un unstructured you know, data that I collected from interviews. Mm -hmm. and I need to be able to apply that or uh, I guess maybe extract from the interviews concepts that uh, uh, align themselves or applied to the the concepts on the, of the the actual theoretical framework. Do you have any examples of? Yeah, that? I think it's quite similar to um, um, using 
um, what we call it, I have a PowerPoint here that talks a little bit about it. So use it doing, uh, let me go back here. Um, yes, doing content analysis, right? So sometimes we, hold, we call it qualitative content analysis. So when you're doing qualitative content analysis, first you have to develop a coding frame. So the coding frame can be um, be influenced by existing theoretical framework. So based on the theoretical framework, um, then you go into the data trying to identify significant information that match those theoretical framework, the concept in the theoretical framework, right? So you, you can use it as a way of initial coding frame. You go to the data, you drop that information that are related to the theoretical framework, and sometimes you have to be a little bit flexible in a sense that you may identify significant information that directly doesn't fit the theoretical framework. So this is where you have to make a little adjustment to the theoretical framework as you are doing the coding process. Am I making sense? Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I think you can email me and I can send this PowerPoint to you just to get a, a, that basic information about um, as I said, it's similar to content analysis, um, a coding frame. So a coding frame is just having um, categories and themes. You have already developed the categories and themes based on existing theoretical framework. And then you start the data, go through the data and see. Um, so you can see that the categories will be like containers, and then you go into the data and drop the significant information to the, those containers. You realize that some of the categories has nothing to do with the significant information you have identified. This is where you, you create additional categories or code so that you be at the end of the day, you may have to adjust the theoretical framework because uh, so that it will be in line with the data, the current data that you have. So you'll be able to do that. Any other question? There's a handful of questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, it's actually a series. Um, but before that, there is another question, uh, namely, do we put the verbatim statements in the software? Yes. So what will happen is that you upload participant um, uh, responses um, to the questions, the interview transcript, you di directly upload them into the system. So let me show you how it's done. Um, I don't have interview questions. Can you, can you please hold on? Uh, um, so what was the question, um, Dr. Glazik, again? I just want to make sure that... Um, right. uh, do we put the verbatim statements in the software? Yes, you could do that. And I was about to show you how to put that information. Okay, let, let's assume that what we have here, um, they are participant the interview transcript, right? So we have about 10 participants and this, this, we are just assuming that these are all interview transcripts. So when you open in vivo, um, to take a little while uh, to open. And then you you click on a blank and then maybe, let's, let, let me put test. I'm just testing. Oh, this is this thing. Okay, uh, test two. Okay, so you go to um, data, and then because the data, they are in PDFs, um, they can, if they are in Word document, you can click on document, but the data that I'm, I'm going to upload right now, they are in PDF, so let's assume that. So these, let's assume that these are participants, um, each of them are participant transcripts, so you, you copy all of them, open and then click on OK. So what will happen is that you can download that information here. So you have all the information. When you go to internals, all the participant transcripts will be here, right? And then you can open, double click it and open and then start the coding process. So you, you can, you know, upload all the information here. Uh, the second option 
is to develop um, um, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I think I have a copy here, Flip Classroom, uh, examples, looking for one. Okay, so you develop Excel spreadsheet uh, with all participant information. So you can see here that I have uh, participant ID, I have demographic, um, the, uh, the, uh, the years of experience, their rank, and also other demographic information, and also participant responses. So after the demographic information, each of the column you can, you know, you can put the questions that you ask participant, and then in under that you put their responses. So you can put all participant information in Excel, and then after that you save and close it, and then you can upload that information into um, in vivo for you to do the analysis. So there are two ways that you can upload uh, participant information. Yes. Any additional question? So there is a series of questions. Um, the first one is what kind of recording device is recommended for audio taping interviews? Um, there are so many. You can even use an iPad to do that. Um, so um, you just have to, um, I don't uh, have specific recording device, but any, any device that can record participant information. Um, you can even use GoToMeeting to do the, the recording and then you can download that information. So you have, they have so, we have so many. Um, you just have to see what is out there and use it to do the recording. Yeah. Dr. Du, if I might add, I, I used a, a, a service called rev.com, mm -hmm. and they have an app, iPhone app. I used it for all my interviews. Oh. Uh, there were a few interviews that I, I didn't get. I just got through GoToMeeting, and mm -hmm. I was able to record the GoToMeeting and, and send them the, uh, the audio file from that, and they tra did all the transcriptions for me. Oh. Really cheap service, too. Like a dollar a minute or something. Uh, can you type in the a website for us so that everybody know? Yeah, I put it in the. Uh, I already put Chambers. it in, but I'll put oh. it again. Okay, great. Thank you for this information. So uh, another question, uh, and I think this is maybe related to what uh, Dante just mentioned, uh, but where do I send the audio to get transcripts made? Um, it, they have, um, um, there also is a, a, a website called um, the Odesk, let me see, odesk.com, there are, um, that you can use their service, so you can identify a person there to, uh, who is available uh, for a fee to uh, transcribe all your data for you, but I, I think that you have to be um, sure about the person before you send all your information. So what, one um, way of doing this, after you, you have identified the person, you can send one interview, uh, interview recording for them to transcribe and send it to you and see whether you are okay with it before you send everything to them. So um, this website can also help to look for somebody that could help you and also transcribe me. I think somebody type that in, it can also help. So, um, but I always tell students that if you have time, do it yourself. I think that it will help you um, to even better understand the participant responses. Um, as you are transcribing, you are understanding their responses. And um, so if you have time, it would be great if you can do it yourself, yeah, instead of giving it to someone to do it. Okay, so another question, uh, this one might be a bit more in-depth, uh, are suggested coding methods consistent across all types of qualitative research, i.e. Uh, ontological, narrative, phenomenological, etc.? No, they are very, um, they're a little bit different. Um, um, I think the book that I showed will give you some examples. Um, there, um, there are some 
methodology that the, the, the coding process or data, data analysis process is a little bit different. I think I did a presentation or if you are using tran, uh, transcendental phenomenological approach, there is a specific way that you have to analyze your data. I have, I did a presentation on that. Um, if you are using human who, who hermeneutic phenomenological approach, you, there's a way that you have to so there are specific um, research up qualitative research approach that is required that you have to follow a, a certain way of analyzing your data. But if you are doing a general phenomenological, you are using a, like a phenomenological approach in general, you can use the um, we call it generic way of analyzing data. What is the generic way of analyzing the data? You identify significant information, right? And then you assign labels to them, you categorize them, and then based on the, the themes that you have, you address the research question. And sometimes you have to go beyond that and trying to find out what are the relationship between the themes, right? Um, so that you can really have a, a whole um, complete story to tell. Uh, your audience. So um, it, it depends on the specific research method that you're using. I think that will help you too. But I have a couple of presentations that I've done um, in relation to this. So <clears throat> another question. Um, this one may be more appropriate for a, a methodology consultation, but I'll read it anyway. Mm. Uh, can you please talk a bit more about directed content analysis? In my study, it is an umbrella term for coding methods in my second coding cycle. Uh, hypothesis coding, descriptive coding, in vivo coding, and value coding. Is this correct? Is magnitude coding a form of directed content analysis? How does hypothesis coding relate coding frame? Oh gosh, there's a lot of questions. I, I think that uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Glazik said, I think we have to meet one-on-one to discuss this. Um, we, you have to, the most important is to be consistent in the process. Um, if you are using um, um, a specific research methods like um, no a specific coding um, um, qualitative analysis uh, like concept um, content analysis there's a specific way that you have to go by it um, content analysis is more of identifying meaningful information and trying to assign labels to them um, but we have two main types of content. We have qualitative and quantitative. The qualitative one is less you, you is less standardized, so, so this means that you have to look into the content context and also the background of participant information for you to better assign labels to them. Yes, you can also use uh, some coding methods like magnitude coding or in, um, in vivo or value coding, but the most important thing is, is that look at your research question, right? Is research question related to uh, expressing participant emotions? Is it related to the value that participant um, have concerning what they are talking about? And then you can use value coding. So based on the book that I've read that I showed you, um, most of the time you should allow your research question to help you to determine a specific coding method that is appropriate. For your study. So I think we can meet one-on-one -on -one and have a discussion concerning how you are analyzing the data um, and, and we see the best way. Yeah. Any other question?
by lost the audio is lost hello yes so i lost you um i think i was having problem with the audio um i'm sorry about that um, i lost the connection so um dr kuba uh glasses um do you want to uh, ask the questions for me uh so the next question was which version of in vivo do you recommend oh version 11 um, normally, um, I, I recommend the Pro, uh, NVivo 11 Pro uh, will be okay for you. Um, so they have a student version, which is about $120 a year. So I will recommend um, NVivo Pro, 11 Pro. Those appear to be all the questions for now. Oh, okay, great. So um, let me see. And also... Let me unmute all of you. Is there anybody who want to ask questions? Okay, so if not, I can continue the process. Uh, let me unmute, okay. So, okay, so for qualitative, when you are using in vivo, um, I, I, oh, you always have to think about this, um, the, um, soft software this way. So it's the same thing as the, um, manual coding where you identify significant information and assign labels to them. So in this case, you as a researcher are creating containers, we call it nodes right and you create content and then put significant information into that so um i did a presentation on this um i think i have a powerpoint here now i just want to show you how um i think it's this one no i don't think it's this one yeah, I have a lot of PowerPoint here. I think it's not this. I have to just go online. I think, yeah, it might be this one. Okay, let me try this and see. Oh, yes, it's this one. Okay, so sorry about that. I have a lot. So, you know, you can, you can see it as, you know, you create containers, right? You identify significant information, you create containers, and then you put the significant information into the containers, right? So um, the number of times you put the significant information into the container is called reference. So if you put the significant information uh, about uh, into the container for about 23 times, you're gonna have 23 references, right? So your role is to create nodes and then you label the node. The label is the, um, the um, code name that you are giving to the container based on the information that you are giving is uh, putting them in inside the container. So what is the content of the container? You just based on the content, you give a name to that. And then you have an option to describe what 
the, na the name is all about or to give more information about the name and then you also have a ch chance to also add memo your reflections what are your thoughts concerning what you have put in the container so it's all about creating a container or a group of containers and put significant information inside right so after that you'll be able to categorize uh, the notes and then you can get sub notes or subcategories and all you can have the main category also you can develop we call it parent node which is the theme so after developing nodes or code you can bring them together and then it, you come up with categories and themes so that's how the system is um, any question concerning that as I said I have a lot of uh, videos on using in vivo um, so I think there's a question here Kuba. yeah there's a handful actually um, so the first one, <clears throat> uh, I'm having difficulty with changing the order of the parent theme nodes I have developed. I have tried dragging and dropping them into the right order, but haven't been able to get that to work. Could you please demonstrate how to do that? I'm on in vivo Pro 11 for Windows. Okay, so let me open one of the data that I have. I think I have, uh, okay, let me use this one. Are you using Mac or PC? It's Windows. So uh -huh. okay, so PC. Okay, so um, this is the data I analyze for faculty responses to our services, and then under nodes, I have all these. Um, you can see that I first develop research questions. Yeah, so I develop a container. Okay, let me go back here. Uh, before I did the analysis, I first developed containers. I developed one, two, three, four containers based on the research question, right? So, so that when I'm coding, I put the significant information to their respective research question or respective containers that I've developed. So these are initial code. With, uh, we call I call it anchor code because. It's a label that you use for the research question. So I have four research questions. I have four containers. And under the research question, I, I, I was able to um, create node and then drop significant information to, into it. So I can see that this one, I dropped three significant information. And then here, I drop two. Here, I drop one. So your question is that, um, Let's say I want to drop this information, significant improvement, into this. So I just highlight it, use, um, or you just make sure that it's highlighted, and then you move it, and then I can drop it inside this one. So for mine, I was able to drop. So you can see that now this one is under this. You see that? If I want to take it out of that, I move it again. And then bring it here so that it will be it will be under the research question, not under this theme, right? So I can move it again, go back here, and it's back to the uh, original place. So for me, I will be uh, I can do that. I'm not I don't know why you find it very um it's, yours is not working. You can try that right now and see. So you just highlight it and move it to the place that you want. And then if you think that you change your mind that, oh, no, it doesn't belong here, then you can bring it to original place. You highlight it again and bring it back to where it is. Right. So. So Darcy's saying that she's trying to change the order of the anchor notes. Uh, Maybe for audio, then it would be uh, easier for her to describe if it's working. Yes, so let me give her the chance to, let me open. Um, can you explain further whether you have addressed your research question? Um, you can speak now. Yes, uh, hi, this is Darcy, Dr. Do I, um, I'm trying to, I also have done exactly what you've done, which is have the research questions and then create um, child notes underneath those research questions, and mm -hmm. I'm actually 
just wanting to change the order of the um, the anchor nodes themselves. And so I'm trying to drag and drop them. And that's the part that's hard. I'm able to do what you've just demonstrated. Uh -huh. Good. Yeah, I think um, it will be a little bit challenging because the order is based on alphabetical order. So this means that you can see that C comes first and you can see D comes, uh, this, you know, it has been arranged, so it's going to be, the system is such a way that the default is, the, uh, the nodes should be arranged in alphabetical order, so it's going to be oh, very difficult. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm trying to arrange them in a different sort of order. Okay. Yeah. And then well, even the, uh, quest, the anchor nodes, they are also alphabetical, you're saying? Yes, so I can see that, let me move so you can see that a a a q s you see that but you can if you yeah. want to make it like descending order or something you just click on the name and then it goes it starts with s but you cannot arrange it the way okay. that you want that's uh, that explains it yeah because so. <laughs> i i was trying to have it be in the exact order that i've done it on you the same oh, yeah. line up that way now yeah. i know why thank you you're welcome uh, another Option. Uh, do you want to make it such a way that it it um, the um, it, like a logical process, like from this team you go to this team and that team? That's what you are thinking about. Well, it it is individual participants who are being receiving the interviews, mm -hmm. but I, for me thematically, it makes sense to go in an order of progression of asking the questions versus. Oh alphabetical order because it throws it out of a logical sequential order for me. Yeah. But once the data is all analyzed, I'll be able to use it in the way I want to, yes. right? It won't stay mm -hmm. alphabetical. Yes. Okay. That's fine then. Oh. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other question? Um, so there is uh, another question about um, the following, can you speak briefly about which processes to use for IPA? I'm using the questions in the semi-structured interview to create initial themes and adding new themes as I go. IPA is interpretive, interpre uh, interpretation, um, interpretive, uh, phenomenological approach or something like that? Believe so. uh, analysis, yes. yes. So, um, Yes, so it you could you could do it this way. When as you are, are going on, you identifying significant information, and first you have when you identify significant information, you look at the existing nodes or code that you have created. If it has nothing to do with the existing one, you can create a new one. So you always have to be flexible and. Um, if it's, it doesn't fit, it, it has no relationship with what has already been created, you can create a new one. So, I hope I've addressed your question. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Any other? Uh, there's one other question. Are online transcription services like Rev or Transcribe Me acceptable for use in a dissertation? from the IRB standpoint? Uh, is it a question or a statement? No, it's uh, a question. Is, are, are they, can you use these services? Uh, I guess it pertains to things like anonymity and confidentiality because oh, you'd be sending yes. it to yeah. someone else who may not be authorized to, to read it. Yeah, and you know, um, IRB, the only concern is that you have to make sure that, you know, um, there's a confidentiality of, um, um, and um, in terms of um, individual participants' information, if, if I, 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 I have access to participant transcript or audio transcript, I should not be able to identify who the participant is. So you as a researcher has a responsibility. If you are giving the document or the, the audio to someone, make sure that there's no identifiable information that um, could, uh, someone could trace the person who um, who made um, who who was on the uh, on the audio? So you just have to make sure that you assign labels for them, or you can assign um, 
um, numbers or alphabet or something like what I did for um, let me see I have um, I think I open I just open yes okay so as you can see here I have labels for uh, each participant um, another thing that you have to be careful about is if any demographic information um, is uh, without even mentioning the person's name right sometimes demo some of the demographic information it will be so easy for somebody to identify the person just providing so one example is that in this case if I'm an investigator and I just want to know this person, if I look at, okay, the person has seven years in TSVP, the person is an associate professor, the person is in the clinical psychology, the person is Chicago, that's, I, be, I might be able to identify the person. So you have to be very careful. It's not only the participant name, but demographic information. If you think that some of the demographic information, um, it will be easy for um other people to identify them, you may have to take them out even before you give the audio to someone to um, um, transcribe for you. So that's why sometimes it's very important to, at the beginning of the interview, you can ask them about their demographic information. And then when you're giving the audio, you could even take out the demographic information and then give the main responses to the person who is going to transcribe it to try so that they will not get access to the demographic room. That might be quite sensitive, although the name is not attached, just providing demographic information, somebody will be able to identify the person. So you just have to be very careful um, when giving um, audio um, um, interview audio to somebody to transcribe for you. Any other question? Uh, there's one other question. Um, when is information added for sub questions that arrive during the interview that everyone may not have? Wait, hold on. When is information added for sub questions that arrive during the interview? Um, I guess questions that everyone may not have addressed in other interviews. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, is the person there? If a person can, you know, um, especiate on this. What I was thinking is that there might be um, questions that um, a researcher asks the person that initially the person that um, the researcher didn't um, plan to do that, right? Um, they ask those questions based on how participants responded to the interview, the initial questions. Um, if that it's is, not, yeah. That, uh, Dr. Blue, that is, uh, that is my question. Yes, and, okay. and what happens is in the process of interviewing, sometimes I had people that would elaborate on a particular research sub-question that made me ask additional questions for clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, but that information would not be prevalent to another person who did not go to that depth of answering that particular question. So what do I do with that particular, those particular uh, pieces of information, which in uh, some cases were really great information, but it's not a part of my regular list of questions. Yeah, what you could do is you can create another, um, 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 you can create another column, say maybe other responses or participant last words or something like that you could create and for only that participant so that you you have that information and then when you send it to in vivo you'll be able to analyze if it's important um, during the data analysis so you could create a new um, column for that maybe other responses um, that are not really the main but it's a little bit related and you want to capture that you could create that yeah, it happened. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so if there's no question, I can go on and I think maybe questions can come. Um, as I said, when you um, have your data and you already transcribe it, um, 
you have to first clean the data, right? Data cleaning. And I think that um, one way is to put everything in Excel uh, and then you can um, upload that information into Excel. Um, I can demonstrate how to do that for you now to see. Um, sometimes, because sometimes it's very difficult to, um, um, sometimes the responses are so long that you don't want to put everything in Excel. The second option is to have um, a document, uh, put every participant into one Word document. So um, each, um, let me see, let me show you the second option, how it's going to look like. Um, so as you can see here, you have Barbara, right? So you have a document called Barbara, and then you will click on it. It has all Barbara's response, right? So Henry asks Barbara questions, and these are the, her responses. So each of the um, participants will have a document, right? And then you can name that document. You don't have to give a name like a name, but you can give maybe um, um, uh, numeric Inform, um, identifiable or non-identifiable information there. So uh, in this case, you can upload each of the document into Excel, um, into uh, in vivo and do the analysis. But I always advise that if you, it's okay for you, it's not going to be difficult for you. You can put every question, uh, the questions that you ask participants in each of the column and then put uh, their responses in the cell that is linked to that participant and then you save it and then you close and you open in vivo um, so it, you go to data from other source no not that you know survey you upload it like a survey it's not a survey but you know because it's excel form you can upload it as a survey click on that and you look for the document so let me look uh, for the document the excel thing is examples my here's a lot of okay i got it and then this information will come to give you information about um, how the data will be organized, right? So participant, each participant response will be put in cases. Um, they are um, open and the close and the dismiss the attribute, all the demographic information will be put in another container. And then the, the third container will be the open-ended questions, right, in terms of um, the open-ended responses, uh, the main interview responses will go there. So the demographic will be here, and then the open, um, the main responses will be here, and cases will be each participant. So if there are 10 participants, you're going to have 10 cases, right? If they, um, So when you open each case, it's participant information, their demographics, and also how they respond to the questions. So um, go there and then um look for that information again i think the thing close on me so i have to go back uh where did i get it? i think i got it from here yes and then go to nest and this one is displaying how the um information have been transformed it's going to be like on the table form the participant id and other demographic information and also their main responses you go to nest and then you click on nest again this is where to, it helps you to confirm which ones are open-ended and which ones are close-ended all the close-ended are the demographic information so you have to make sure that all the demographic information have been checked open-ended are the ones that you are going to qualitatively analyze going to assign labels to them these are the participant main responses then you go to finish so when you do that what will happen is um, you click on close and then when you go back to the uh, vivo workspace you can see that all the information has been transferred um, you can see here that the demographic information you cannot analyze it it just linked to the 
main uh, responses so this is the information here that you're going to do the analysis you assign labels to them so you highlight right and then you right click and then you click on code and then you indicate where you want to put that information right normally you put you normally you create a research question node here so uh, and then you can put it under um, this I haven't created because it's a new um, project so then when you determine where you want to put it and then you click on new and then you can give it a label to it based on the content of the significant information right so if it's about maybe um maybe fear i just um so you click on uh, you type fear and then you click, click on okay so when you click on okay when you go back you can see that you click on uh, node you can see that information being created here right and you have one reference because you have dropped only one um, information into that node so when you go here and then the person is also talking about the same thing you highlight and then you drag it and drop it there so now you can have two references if you go to the next part and you realize that it has nothing to do with fear then you don't drop it you create a new node right and then the same process you right click you you code you click on code and then you indicate where you want to put it and then you click on new and then you give it a new information right um, um i'm thinking of uh, what to type here you know it, it all depends on the content and you know, it depends on the coding method that you want to use so when you finish you click on ok and then the information will here so that's how you're going to do the coding process and then when you finish so when you finish the good thing is that you'll be able to um explore go to explore and see the connections this is where you can visually rep uh, determine uh, present a visual representation of your findings right so let's say you want to find out what information you want to know more about maybe participant um participant a or something like that um, so you look for the participant information uh, normally you go to case and you click on that you can see okay I have participant maybe we want to know a little bit about participant a1 so you bring that information you drag it and put it here and then you can right click and go to show association uh, associated items and then you'll be able to connect the demographic information and see what is going on with the person um, so let's say you want to know how many years they have spent so they have spent seven years in TCSPP program of affiliation clinical psychology and then maybe you want to know about what items are associated with the node that are associated that you created associated with the participant so you'll be able to bring those nodes uh, associated to the participant and see what is really going on um i think stop working okay the thing uh, i think it stopped working i don't know why but i can go back again um, any other question um, I don't want to take a lot of your time, but all yeah, of what I'm doing right now, I've already done it in my other presentation. So you can just go and review some of my presentation. So, okay, question. Uh, so could you please demonstrate a cluster diagram in NVivo? Cluster diagram in NVivo. Okay, let me open, I think, let me open this one. So there are many ways you can find out um, 
after you have developed the nodes or the codes, you can find out how they are related by doing a cluster analysis. You can go to explore and then cluster analysis. And then you click on nodes because you want to focus on how code nodes are related. And then you select the nodes that you want. In this case, uh, maybe you want to find out how that all the nodes are related. So you check all the nodes under each of the research question. This will help you when you are you are about to do the category, like how they are related. And then you click on OK. And you don't want to, you want code similarities, not word similarities. So, and then you click on finish. So this is how cluster we call hierarchical cluster analysis. Um, so you can see here that um, assessing the writing services service at the earlier stage and also chairs better understanding of the content are related. They have something in common. This information will help you to make a decision. Should I put them together to form a category or a theme? You know, um, so doing this analysis will just help you to know whether there's any potential themes or categories here, um, uh, you know, as you think about the content of each of the nodes. So you can also do this to create the, um, um, how each of the, uh, uh, how themes are related. Any other question? Uh, yes, so, <clears throat> Um, I'm not sure if this is uh, something that we have time for, but what is the average number of interview questions that should be used? Interview questions. Uh, we don't know. We don't have agreed number, but the most important thing is uh, looking at your uh, research questions. You come up with specific, simple questions, conversational questions that you think will help you to um, get quality information from participant to address your research question that you have. So you have to allow your research question to inform you the number of interview questions. Um, I might think that if you have about maybe 10 or 7 to 10 questions, interview questions um, related to one main research question that could help you to better understand um, what is going on with participant, but you know we don't have that agreed form. But the most important thing is to ask yourself, what specific questions should I ask participant to help me to get rich information to address my research question, right? And then um, if you have several research questions, you can develop interview questions and then match the research question to the interview question to make sure that everything has been covered. You know when you are asking participant questions. Any other question? So the next one, um, say I have some identified correlations in SPSS. Does it make sense to load that data into NVivo to create node diagrams that show relationships for presentation purposes? Um, it, it, this, you know, in vivo is a little, you know, is this, you know, when it comes to qualitative data analysis, it's a little bit limited when it want to find out the correlation and relationship. What you could do is one of the things you could do is that you're doing the cluster analysis, how the in each individual um, codes are related, and that will give you an idea. Um, to, uh, idea in terms of how they are related. Um, one thing that you you can do, um, we call it um, intercoder reliability. So this means that if you want to be sure that um, the codes that you are developing is reliable, right, then you have to maybe work with ad, um, another researcher or a student, and then you can use one um, a, a one interview transcript and see how and come and come up with an agreed code and then you code individually and then you can bring in them together to do to find out where, how they are related and then you can use um, in vivo to know to find out you know um, intercoder uh, intercoder uh, reliability so I can show you how to do it 
um, in case you are coding with somebody. Um, so um, let me open in vivo again and um, you'll be able to do do that. And I, and I think that you know you always have to think when you are do, doing a qualitative analysis, in vivo is not uh, you know you you shouldn't think about in vivo as uh, like SPSS where you can do some kind of quantitative uh, statistical analysis. They are there to help you to just organize your data that you have, right? It helps you to organize your analysis so that you make it easy for you to, you know, visualize and also present the findings. Um, and it, it, it saves time, right? So it's a quality analysis depends on the person who is doing the analysis, not the software. Um, so uh, in terms of intercoder reliability, you can go to query and click on coding comparison. So maybe you coded with somebody to make sure that, you know, the, whether you are coding in the same way. And then, you know, the user A, so we choose, you, know, you can see that there are about, in this data, there are about four coders, right? So we want to maybe compare Henry codes with Jason code concerning um, for all nodes concerning maybe a specific participant so I'll select the source this is where if you have uploaded the interview uh, individual interview so you can see that individual interviews are there and I just want to know how do they in terms of um, how related are the codes in with respect to Robert's transcript, right? So you check Robert's transcript and then you click on OK. And then you click on Run. So you can see here that this is what you're going to, um, so you only look at a Kappa um, result. So if it's one, this means that they are related, right? And, uh, so you can see that uh, in terms of um, this kind of nodes, they are related. So the nodes are here, and also if it ranges from zero to one. So if it's one, this means that they are related. If it's zero, this means that they are not related. So most of them are related. Um, um, yes, yeah, so you can see that most of them codes are related to um, um, each of the like, you know, when you, you look at both coders and in terms of specific node, they, when it's one, then they are related. When it's zero, they are not related. So you can see individual uh, nodes and how they are related. So you can do that, especially if you want to work with somebody and do the coding for one and see how they are related. You can do this analysis to see how your responses are related to that kind of um, how you coded is related to the second coder. Any other question? I think um, my time is almost up. Yeah, there are some other questions. Um, I mean, I guess if folks have time, uh, you can keep going. Uh, the next one is, can you speak about analyzing artwork created by participants using both their words about their art as well as what shows up in their imagery? Okay, so it's all about uploading the information here. And um, there is a presentation on that. I did not do that presentation. I think um, another uh, researcher did it. I can send you the link. But what will happen is that you... Um, first, have to upload participant information. Um, so, if it's a picture, there is an option here that you can click on and upload that picture. So, you go to um, what picture should I use? Um, let me okay. One of my illustrations. Okay, so you click on that picture, and then you can bring that information here, and you'll be able to do the coding after bringing it. So you can see that the picture is here, and I can start the coding process. So you can click on Edit to edit, and then 
you highlight what you want to code and then you can click on code and then you can give a name to it and put it there so you'll be able to present um upload participant artwork to do the coding process it's the same thing as you can even upload participant audio right and you can code the audio but um one then um one thing that um I always advise that instead of having audios, why don't you transcribe so that you can you be able to analyze it better than audio because sometimes if you want to do like word frequency, the audio will not be able to help. You know, they take uh, uh, if, um, that when it's in the text form, it will be easy for you to um, do some some kind of analysis where the audio will be limited but it doesn't mean that you cannot analyze audio you can also upload audio you can upload video and also um and a lot added to participant information here to do the analysis so you'll be able to do that any other question uh so next up is follow-up question um about JACA coefficient? Is it related to reliability of coding? Um, the one that I did the Kappa. What's that? Um, what what they have um, for um, I don't um, I don't have much information about JAK coefficient there, but I know of Kappa. Normally, that's what they use. Uh, oh, you are talking about the cluster analysis. Um, I don't pay attention to that, um, the coefficient there. What you have to just focus on is how the, um, the, the nodes are clustered in there. Um, so instead of focusing on the, the interpretation of the, the uh, coefficient, just focus on how they are related. I think that will really help a lot. Um, how they have been grouped. That's what, how I look at it. Any other question? I think um, we can, I can give, we can maybe spend about five minutes. If there's a uh, question I'll be able to answer. Uh, you can speak if you want. Um, because um, as I said, I didn't, I, was, I didn't want to make it like a presentation. I just want to be your Q and A, and making sure that I've addressed all your research, uh, your questions. And if you feel like um, you want specific uh, answers for your study, you know, you can book an appointment with me, and I'll be happy to work with you um, in terms of analyzing your data. There's so much to learn here. Um, I haven't completely uh, learned everything, but I have um, basic information that could help you to analyze your data to um, address your research question that you have. Any question? I think that's it. Okay. So thank you for your time. And um, I will see you another time. <laughs> we'll talk another time. So thank you for being here. And thank you for your questions too. Okay. Bye.